30 years ago, I stood in front of a comic shop advertising the death of Superman in its window display. That moment outside Heroes World set me on a path, a lifelong fan journey leading directly from that tattered red cape to this podcast. Now, together, we mine Superman's vast 85-year mythology by examining, discovering, and reconsidering the stories that have shaped the last son of Krypton. Welcome to Digging for Kryptonite, a Superman fan journey. I'm your host, Anthony Desiato. Joining me to discuss the three-issue miniseries Superman Space Age by Mark Russell and Mike Allred is returning guest, my pal, Dr. Bill Mayo. Welcome. Hey, Anthony. Thanks for having me again. Oh, my pleasure. We are now officially in the in the next hundred episodes of Digging for Kryptonite. Last week was episode 100. This This is 101. So we are now, we've now crossed that threshold. The next hundred episodes have begun. Great. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's great. It's, it's, I've been having the best time and I'm excited to, to just keep digging into all of this stuff, starting with this mini series. You know, what I mentioned last time uh, we talked, and I think we were talking about Batman or maybe we were talking about Superman the last time. I think we were talking about the, uh, that Frank Miller Superman run. And I was saying how you know impressed I am. The number of issues that you read uh, on a monthly basis is kind of incredible. <laughs> it's like a testament to your love of this character. That's the thing. I think there, are, there, are, it's a very short list of topics that I would devote this kind of ongoing, sustained podcast to. It's a very, very mm-hmm. short list. It's Superman, yeah. essentially, and so that's why we're doing this. But it's funny because. We went through a bunch of audience questions. We did our Metropolis mailbag segment in the 100th last week. Well, okay. One question that we actually didn't get to, and I believe this was from our patron, Brian, but I could be mistaken. Don't hold me to that. But I think it was Brian's question, which was about to what extent am I kind of reading and watching things not for the podcast? Mm-hmm. And there are some things, I mean, mostly in, in terms of viewing, it's, you know, things that I watch with my wife, for example, that have nothing to do with this podcast. Like we watch Riverdale and we watch Barry and we, you know, so it's like we have our shows that we watch, but for me sure. personally, and especially when it comes to reading, you know, one of the things I found, and I, I don't know that this is a good thing, but unless I'm doing an episode about something, I find that I really don't carve out the time to to read it and you know I, and this is a good segue because they're looking at something like superman space age i bought those issues as they were coming out and i actually read issue one right when it came out and i was like this is great i can't wait to read yeah. the rest and i bought issue two and i put it on top of issue one and it sat there and then i got to the point where and then there were delays and i was like oh, i'll just wait till the third one comes out and then i'll read it yeah. and i got issue three put that on the pile and it's just sat there until last night when I said, okay, <laughs> now yeah. it's time because we're doing time. an episode on it. So that's a, a, a long-winded way of saying that, a, again, mostly, especially when we're talking about comic book reading, uh, what, what I'm reading is really for this podcast, and I, and it's, it's, but it motivates me. So that's, it, so, you know, it all works. Yeah, no, I get it. I mean, it's hard not to be productive in terms of reading something because, you know, you're going to write something or, or, you know, do a podcast on it. Um, yeah, but yeah. that's ultimately frustrating as a comic book fan or enthusiast like you used to be. It's hard to like see something on the shelf. Like I was – so I picked up Crisis this past week. I went to uh, Barnes & Noble because like I don't go to the comic book shop here in town. And uh, there were so many things on the shelf. I was like, I didn't know this came out. I was like super excited. But, you know, I didn't buy anything yet. But I, I took pictures of it. There was like a Catwoman run that was by um, – Oh, what's his name? Cliff Chang that I had never even heard of. Looked really cool. Uh, anyway, I was just excited. I was excited. So, um, but I'll have I'll have the time to read them. I'm sorry that you feel like you can only read things that you're going to do a podcast on. Yeah, I mean, not not to psychoanalyze myself, but I, I mean, I think a lot of it just is a function of of time. Like it it is carving out the time, and it's just sort of, I guess I've conditioned myself to you know, to, and I don't want to say make myself do it. Like I'm doing it begrudgingly. I do it happily, but it's just, I just want, I lock in when I know, okay, like I'm reading or watching something for the podcast. And I guess I I am doing so much for for this and the other podcast that, you know, that really dominates. And so I don't know, maybe part of it is just, there's less of a, less of an appetite, I suppose, to, to read stuff that I'm not covering, but, but I, I mean, I do have an interest in other things and there will probably be a new podcast project to accommodate that down the line. So oh, is tuned. that right? Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm 
don't have enough. You well, don't have enough on your plate, right? It's listen, we, you know, we have a few different podcast series going and, you know, some things end and some things start. And so there might be yeah. some space for it. And it, it's just one of these things where I've kind of learned if I want to, you know, if I have an interest in really diving in and talking about something, the way to make sure that it happens is is to kind of make it something yeah. that I cover. This format. So, yeah. 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 So okay. we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. All right. So this Superman Space Age miniseries. So three issues, each 80 pages. And actually, the day that this episode comes out, the hardcover collection of the entire miniseries is available. Already? Wow. Okay. Yeah. And for the life of me, I don't know if I planned that, if I if I, <laughs> if I knew the date that the hardcover was coming out. And I was like, well, that's when yeah. we'll drop the episode, or, or if it was just a happy coincidence. But I don't know. But the spreadsheet told me this was when the episode was coming out, so it, <laughs> it worked. Yeah, it's perfect. So, you know, this came out over a span of months. It was originally intended to be released... Uh, bi-monthly, and then there were delays. So it, it took quite a while before the entire thing was completed. But uh, Superman Space Age, written by Mark Russell, drawn by uh, uh, Mike Allred, colored by Laura Allred. And sort of the central premise is that it covers uh, about a two-decade span from the mid-60s uh, through the mid-80s. And so we sort mm-hmm. of see the dawn of Superman and the rest of the DC universe set against the backdrop of real-world history that was going on at the time in terms of yeah. of the space age and the civil rights movement and Watergate and, and so on, as well as the backdrop of the DC universe, specifically the looming crisis on infinite Earth. So Clark is told very early on in the story by uh, Pariah that yeah. this crisis is coming and the universe, the multiverse is going to be destroyed. And so that's kind of hanging over the the proceedings as well. The, the, one I, of the I main mean, reasons, and you know from page one, too. I mean, in page one, you know. The Fortress of Solitude is crumbling. Yes. And I, I just wanted to say, you know, one of the main re- reasons that I wanted to have you on here, I mean, A, I always enjoy chatting with you, and this gives us yeah. an opportunity to sit down and catch up and, and do all of this. But it's also, you know, I've had you on before to talk about DC, the new frontier. Mm-hmm. And there, I feel like there are a lot of echoes of that in this story, specifically in terms of how it weaves the history of the DC universe into, you know, act- actual history. Uh, and also, you know, I know how dialed into the art you are. And mm-hmm. in my mind, I'm like, oh, he's a huge Mike Allred fan. I actually don't know that. I just kind of assumed it. And I, whether it's the, the case or not, it, you, yeah. I always enjoy getting your take on on the art side of it. So I felt like you'd be perfect for this. Well, I, I love Mike Allred. I'm <laughs> surrounded by some Mike Allred right now. Uh, I, I took some out just the other night. So the Madman, obviously, and this solo issue is always my favorite DC solo issue. Uh, but Mike Allred's art is always incredible. Um, and I really f- think it fits the tone really well in this book. And it's very evocative, certainly, of the Darwin Cook New Frontier. I mean, obviously, he's no Darwin Cook, but it has that, not a cartoony style, but more cartoony than like uh, George Perez, for example. You know, And so it really lends itself well to this retelling of the story. And you can't read this and not think Darwin Cook the whole time, uh, New Frontier. I mean, it has that kind of feel to it. Um, Yes, certainly which, with the aesthetic of that age, which which may or may not be a benefit. We'll talk about this. I had okay. Look, I'll, sure. I'll just say, kind of big picture, I enjoyed this. Uh, our our friend Tyler Patrick from Krypton Report. He recently did an episode of, of his podcast on this, and and I want to echo one of the things he said there, where he was like, "I feel like this is something that needs to kind of marinate, and I need to come back to it, and maybe I'll read it again yeah. in a year." And I kind of feel the same. You know, over the course of doing these hundred episodes. There have been a couple of things. Superman 2, for example, uh, the Tom Welling scene in Crisis on Infinite Earths on television. There have been a couple of examples where I've done more than one episode over a span of time, and my opinion has changed as, as I've kind sure, of let things sure. sit for a while. And I have a feeling we might be doing another Space Age episode in the future, because I think this is okay. one that kind of needs some time to sit and and probably subsequent readings and things like that. Overall, I enjoyed it. I really appreciate what it was aiming to do. There were a few things that I was kind of bumping up against. And in the end, I guess I came away from it just a little bit more mixed than I thought I was going to be. Because again, I really love the yeah. start. I love the premise. I love this the idea of this kind of project. Uh, mm-hmm. So there's a lot about it that I liked. And I guess ultimately, I, I wanted to love it. I wanted to really love it. And I didn't quite get there. I got pretty close though. So a little bit more mixed, but what were your overall impressions of this? So like you, I wanted to love this. 
first issue I thought was incredible. I read that first issue over the span of three days because I just kept putting it down. Um, and I do this a lot with movies, like a Quentin Tarantino movie. I like watch certain scenes. I'm like, I got to take a pause for a second because that was just so beautiful. That was shot, the writing, everything. And I feel like this first issue was just like filled with like these one-liners back and forth. It's like, oh my gosh, such deep thought. Like you just had to read a line. You're like, let me think about this. Like Jonathan Kent, you know, talking to, you know, a young Clark Kent. And you're like, holy shit. Some of the wisdom that he's just imparting on a young Superman is just incredible. Uh, but then as I kept reading the issues two and three, it, like the story just progressed so fast and then it kind of just came to an end faster than I think that they even maybe intended to it. I think that I love, like you said, the premise where this is set in the DC universe. I think this would have been a better served as like a six part issue than the three part. I feel like even with the 80 pages, they were too ambitious. Um, and certainly when they tried to draw a conclusion to this, that it just kind of uh, fell short. Uh, but I, ultimately, I think this is one of the better comics I've read in a long time. I really, really enjoyed this. Gotcha. And, I, you know, I need to see what R Mark Russell has written because incredible writer. Yeah, he uh, did a great job. And, you know, he's been really yeah. responsive on Twitter. You know, he's, he responds to people. I, you know, I, I tweeted about yeah. this and tagged him in all red. And I think they both liked it and retweeted. Like, they're very responsive. Okay. And that's awesome. And, uh, you know, well, actually, two things. Number one, you know, folks, if you haven't yet read Space Age, you know, there will be spoilers here, as there always are when we're talking mm -hmm. about any of these subjects. So if you haven't read it yet and you don't want to be spoiled, you know, maybe... Maybe save this episode, positive. but but yeah. if you've read it or you don't care about being spoiled, you know, join us. Uh, you know, and the other thing too is I, I think generally the sense that I get from kind of what I've seen online and reviews and things like that, I think this generally was was quite well received and mm -hmm. and I love that. And I so it's like part of me is coming into this and it's like God, like I you know I don't want to be a dick and then just kind of like yuck anyone's yum as the saying goes. You know, if you enjoyed yeah. it and you loved it and you loved it as much as I wanted to love it. That's great. Yeah. I'm, I'm not trying to talk anyone out of it. There's, there's a, there's a lot that's just so, so good here, but uh, that's actually kind of comforting to hear your take because I, again, I, I finished this last night and I was like, uh, all right, yeah. I'm still wrestling with it a little bit. So I'm glad to hear I'm not alone. You know, yeah. there's been books where like, like again, to bring up the, uh, the Frank Miller Superman, I read it once, never read it again, <laughs> never in my life will I read it again. Uh, it left such a bad taste in my mouth. But like you said, with these, I'm going to go back to them in a year and see, you know, where we sit with this story. Um, I get the sense that I think it's going to be even better the second time through. Probably. It's not going to be like the Dark Knight, what is it, the Strikes Back, where it's like, strikes we were hoping again. that it was going to get better. <laughs> strikes again. Strikes again. <laughs> That's right. The Strikes again. We thought it was going to be better, but it was ultimately worse. I know. So, hey, speaking of uh, patron questions, and, and Brian Dempsey in particular, he sent in a question, a big picture question about Space Age. Uh, so I'll read it again. Patron privilege here. Uh, if mm -hmm. you are at that uh, tier on our Patreon community, you can submit a question or comment to be read with your name in the episode. Uh, Brian uh, makes the most of this, always has great questions, uh, and it really helps flesh out our episode. So I, I appreciate it, uh, and I hope that for patrons at that level, it's a fun perk. Okay, so he says, my question, why do you think we don't get more out-of-continuity Superman stories? Uh, the series Superman Confidential didn't last very long, so, Bill, that was the one uh, that launched with the Kryptonite arc by Darwin Cook and Tim Sale. And the, the idea mm -hmm. with that whole series was stories early on in Superman's career. So he said, Superman Confidential didn't last very long. And uh, we had a new volume of adventures around a decade ago collecting digital first stories. But Batman gets a slew of early days retellings and Legends of the Dark Knight ran forever. Um, this story, Space Age, hit the classic characters so well. And we know there's an audience for this. Curious what you and your guest think. Yeah, like why... Why don't we get more of these kinds of stories for Superman in particular? What do you think? You know, I mean, if I was a writer, I think I would enjoy writing Batman more. That's just me because I love. I, all right, this is where I say I don't want to. I don't want to be a dick, but I think Mark Russell might feel the same because there's an awful lot of Batman in this story. So, and it doesn't work in this. You know, uh, it's ultimately, you know, you have this the Superman story. And you have the Justice League, which is, it's natural to have a Justice League with all the characters. But then you have, like, Batman, like, vignettes. But they're longer than they need to be. And it's, like, his dialogue taking over and not just Superman writing in his journal. And it's like, well, how does this fit properly? And ultimately, like, that story was good. Um, 
but we or we should double back to that because obviously we're not answering the question. I don't know why there's not more Superman uh, stuff, but there is like a lot of Superman elsewhere. Let me think about the nail. That's a great one. Then there's the uh, the Red Sun. These are good ones. No, okay. They're maybe so, or they're, they're like heavy hitters. Maybe like when the Superman comes out, they're always pretty good. But then the Batman's ones are like, yeah, it's all right. Well, it's you know it's funny that you. I think you and I both gravitated towards the same thing, something like Red Sun or Superman's Secret Identity, which we're actually going to be covering mm-hmm. very soon. It might even be our next episode. I have to double check. But, you know, those are those are like 20 years old at this point. Yeah. So I, I think part of it is, you know, yes, we have had some wonderful, you know, Elseworld slash out of continuity Superman stories, but uh, you know, not so much now. You know, you were on a, a recent episode of one of my other podcasts, My Comic Shop History, and we kind of talked a bit about this idea you know, the fact that DC's publishing slate was so Batman dominant. Now, even in the time since we recorded that episode a few months ago, things have shifted a lot. And I think specifically on the Superman side, we are seeing a bit of a renaissance and there's more titles now. I mean, he has two ongoing titles. There's a John Kent miniseries. There's a Superboy miniseries, a Steel miniseries. Like there's, there's a lot going on now in a way that there wasn't not too long ago. So I guess to Brian's question, I mean, hopefully this is changing as for why we haven't had more when we've had so much on the Batman side, you know, I, I don't know that it's so much that creators aren't pitching these things or, or have a desire to do it. I feel like on the, on the publishing side, I really don't know, but I feel like on the publishing mm-hmm. side, there's a belief, correct or not, <laughs> but a belief that maybe there's not an appetite for this. And Batman feels like more of a, more of a slam dunk for them. I mean, I, it seems like Space Age did well and I hope it, you know, I don't know the numbers, but I, I hope it did. And I hope this spurs more of these yeah. kinds of projects yeah let's hope this ushers in a whole new renaissance like you said of superman elsewhere's world's uh stories for sure yeah no I, absolutely i you know there's there's a lot to to kind of unpack here in this you know 240 page story that spans a couple of decades and i mean as far as as far as where to start i, I guess hey, let me ask you the biggest picture question first because this was one of the things that I was I was sort of wrestling with. There are a lot of there are a lot of philosophical ideas that are at least mentioned, if not if not fully explored in this miniseries about what it means, what hope is, what it means to save the world, what it means to to even be here at all. And I guess I'm curious, like, what do you think? I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but like, what do you think this story is ultimately? about or trying to say like what was your ultimate takeaway about what this was really saying you know you can't answer that maybe in a year i can answer that maybe after five readings of this i can answer that um like you said there was uh like the 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 philosophy or the philosophical type stuff in this this story it's like to say that there was a lot of it is an understatement and also to say that the word hope was used a lot is also an understatement, right? Because like it seemed like every page there was that word hope. And so I don't know what you know Mark Russell was hoping to achieve um, with this story. But obviously there's so many different aspects of it. There's like this beautiful father-son story at the heart of it, right? Not only with you know Superman and 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 Jonathan Kent, but also his father Jorel, right? I mean, there's this really great imparting their knowledge. Um, and and ushering him into the superhero or the hero that he becomes. I mean, at the heart of this story, Superman is becoming who we know as Superman, right? He's he's a young kid at the beginning, and now he's going to be the savior of the world, um, like his his both fathers really intended him to be. Um, but you know, aside from that, there's this hope aspect, right? And so, obviously, uh, daring to hope that they can change some kind of a future that's kind of set in stone, knowing that the world is going to end. How does Superman kind of hope to change that and you know you know i think his like was a little wonky but this is the first time i ever saw superman as scientist which is really great like embodying his his kryptonian father and and inventing a drug but at the same time stealing the dna of all these people so that he can like you know save them in a way i mean it was kind of this beautiful thing um and again then woven into this you have all these like morality type things like that that one issue that talked about the trolley car or whatever, and Batman's going to save, you know, one or kill one person so he can save five. And Superman's like, why are you going to play God? I mean, there's just such great stuff. I can't even unpack this in, um, 
and and the notes that I have on this, I don't even know where to start because it was just so dense. Um, and I think a lot of it came from issue one, though. That's the thing that I really keep harking on. Like issue one was so well developed um, that the other two issues, I was hoping there would be like that, but I wound up reading the other two issues a lot faster than the first one. And it was just like, oh, the story's kind of falling apart a little bit, but ultimately it was still great. Yes. I, Tell I, me I, what you think this know, this was all about. That's the thing. And and, and I guess that's my, my other question. I, I won't put you on the spot again, but kind of just big picture. If, you know, if we're not able to kind of say what this was all about in the end, I don't is know, is that, is that a shortcoming on, are we missing something or, you know, was there something that didn't fully coalesce here that could or should have? And I don't know, but yes, there are definitely a lot of ideas about, again, heroism and just existence, just kind of being here at all and, and the nature of hope and, and all of that. I will say, yes, a lot of space is given to this trolley car problem, this idea that if you have a trolley uh, and there are five people, you know, uh, you know, tied to the ground in front of you to the track, uh, and you have the ability to divert the trolley to save those five people, but in doing so, you're going to kill one worker uh, on the other track, would you do it, right? So this comes up in issue two. Uh, Bruce Wayne has built the Hall of Justice for the budding Justice League of America, and uh, as, as Batman sort of laments, you know, he he thought this was going to be this place of action, and instead it's become this like very pricey yeah. uh, debate club as right. the heroes are talking about these kinds of questions. And I think it's Green Arrow in particular who brings up this idea of the trolley car problem. Again, in 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 philosophy, like this is a big, you know, this is a, a big question, kind of like a philosophy 101, like what do you do? And yeah, you know, you get Batman and Superman's takes on this. And, and to your point with Batman, it's like you you divert the trolley. You kill the one person because you don't want the the mastermind to, to, to get what they want yeah, sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. Whereas Superman is like you try oh, to Batman. save everybody. Yeah. Again, I don't want to be a jerk here, but the the Superman Superman's response made me think, and I know I've mentioned this before on other, at least one other episode, but there's a one of my favorite bits from The Office. Mm -hmm. They're having an ethics discussion, and Andy Bernard poses uh, the ethical dilemma: Would you would you steal bread to feed your family? And Michael Scott very proudly, you know, he he, he it kind of has the air of like I can't believe no one else came to this answer. Michael Scott very proudly is like, well. I wouldn't steal the bread and I wouldn't let my family go hungry. And he's so pleased with himself that he like yeah. got the right answer. <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah. all right, that doesn't really answer the question. And I'm not saying that Superman sounds like Michael Scott in that instance, but, mm -hmm. but you know, but the whole thing of like, well, I would just try to save everyone. It's like, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. Good. Okay. But you can't, <laughs> you want to pat him on the head. Good. Good for you, Superman. That's the right answer. You know, again, I don't mean to be flip. And, and I guess that's ultimately the point. I mean, there's this kind of, this innocence and, and purity of spirit when it comes to Superman. And it's like, yeah, he will always try to save everyone. But again, just in reading that, I couldn't help but think of Michael Scott yeah. and, and the, and the bread and, and ultimately the wrong dilemma. answer. Yeah. So, you know, again, I, like I said, there's, there will be spoilers here and let's just dive into this. In the end, Superman is not able to stop the crisis, to stop the anti-monitor, his earth, his universe succumbs but what he is able to do, uh, as you had mentioned before, uh, he had scanned the DNA of almost everyone on Earth and was able to send that through to another universe, to another Earth, to his counterpart there, who was able to sort of recreate everybody, thus preserving the, the human race. And it's one of these things where, were you, not so much with the, you know, um, the DNA bit, but the fact that you know, the earth that we're following here in the story that he, he's not able to save it. Were you surprised by that? Or did you feel like, no, this is what this had all been building toward? No, I mean, obviously from, from crisis, we learned how many earths succumbed, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, this is a story of one of those earths where Superman ultimately was not able, or the superheroes in general were not able to save it. Uh, but it's, it's weird. It's not something that you're used to reading, obviously, you know, you're almost assured that by the end, Superman will have saved the day and he did not but he did in a part in a way he did right so that's him daring to change you know this expected outcome um, which I thought was a really nice take on it no that's the thing I you know it's funny because I and I know you like you said you've been rereading crisis uh, as I announced in our last episode we have a massive crisis uh, run of episodes coming up we're gonna be looking yeah. at all the DC crisis events it's gonna be crazy okay, it's cool. gonna be a very fun summer I'm gonna be fried by the end of it but it's gonna be a lot of fun yeah 
So I'll be rereading it. But, I, you know, in my mind, again, I knew this. Oh, and we lost Bill there. OK, <laughs> hopefully he uh, hopefully he returns here uh, in the meantime. While ah, here we are. OK, here he is. Oh, there he is. And he's back. OK, I don't know what happened, but you're back and I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> Tell me about your crisis event. <laughs> All right. Hopefully we don't lose you again. All right. So again, we have this, you know, this, this big crisis event coming up. As I was reading this though, I wasn't really, again, I knew it was the, you know, the backdrop, but I wasn't really thinking about it so much, but you're right. I mean, in the context of crisis on infinite earths, you know, untold number of, of universes and worlds died. So it's like, okay, you're following the story of one of these. Yeah. And also, you know, the story tells you from the very beginning how it's going to end, right? It, it opens with yeah. everything falling the- apart. And yeah. Jonathan's saying, like, is it going to be okay? And Clark's like, no, son, it's not. And I, and I guess we're, to the story's credit, I think it, it did subvert my expectation, at least, because we're so conditioned in any comic book story, and especially a Superman story. It's like, well, of course Superman's going to find a way, you know, and, yeah. and he doesn't. Yet he does, again, save humanity in the sense that he sends all of these DNA codes to this other Earth. Now, yeah, um, I, it's funny here because as I've talked about, and as you know from our friendship, I mean, I, I am not religious or or particularly spiritual, yet I do believe whether you want to call it a spirit, essence, soul, you know, that there is something within each of us that makes us who we are. And so this whole idea of, okay, that people are going to be regrown from their DNA, uh, from mm-hmm, this sort mm-hmm. of snapshot when Superman scanned them. It's hard. I don't know. I that was one of the things I bumped up against because I, I don't really look at that and think, "Oh, yes, he saved humanity." It's like, well, they're that's not them. Are you telling me you understand Kryptonian technology? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that scan captured a little bit of their essence. All right. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but obviously, yeah, you're right. Um, I don't know. It was a weird direction, but I think, I mean, obviously it was a nice ending to it, right? It was obviously, it, it tied um, together with the hope aspect that was running throughout the whole thing. Um, and it worked in that regard, but yeah, you're right. A deep thinking of this, it, it shouldn't work. Yeah. Yeah. And look, and I, I don't mean to pick it apart and I, I think it, you know, it, it works, but it's just one of these things where, you know, absent that ending, it's, it's, you know, particularly bleak, I suppose, right? If this world just dies, but the fact that there, you know, this hope, depending on how you define hope, and we'll circle back to that, but mm-hmm. you know, that, that humanity is enduring, is surviving, will be reborn on, on this other world with this other Superman. And, you know, but I don't know. It's like, is it, is it really those people? You know, they're, you know, clones essentially. I mean, I, I don't know. And not, not, but, but I, it's like, but absent that, I mean, that really kind of changes it. So I think you kind of, need that, you know, for, for this all to kind of come together. Um, but I don't know, it was yeah. just, that was one of those things that I was really kind of wrestling with, mm-hmm. you know, um, related, unrelated to that scene. Uh, it was nice to read that scene that end. Right. And then realize that the beginning of the book, he's actually going back to Lois and his son right after that event. Right. So it's really this beautiful full circle, the entire book. Um, so it starts after he's just kind of traded off, the entire human race to the other Superman. Um, and given that Superman, the journal, so you realize that he's been writing this journal that he then passes on to the Superman with like some of the morality that he learned on this earth that I guess he hopefully applies to that new earth with these clones of people who have no souls. <laughs> Again, <laughs> not religious. This is, I, I feel like I'm oh, a very unlikely it. candidate to be making this argument, but look, I want to talk about a lot of the things that I, I really did enjoy about this. Uh, there mm-hmm. are a couple of other problems that I had, but there was a lot that I loved. I'll be honest, man. Even in the opening pages, I was tearing up when he says to Lois, like, have I ever told you how much I love you? And she's like yeah. every day. And he's like, good. Um, I mean, I, it's, you know, again, I yeah. talk about, uh, you know, being a father and a husband a lot on this podcast. And it's like to, to both my wife and my son, I mean, I tell them every day, uh, you know, that I love them and my yeah. son in particular. I mean, every day I'm like, I love you. I love being your dad. Like, I'm so proud of you. And again, he's, he's so little at this point, but yeah. I, I oh get the idea. And it's one of those things where like, not to get too deep here, but you know, part of me says, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to say it so much that it loses its impact, but I'm like, you know what? You can never say something like that. that. Enough. Uh, and I, my, my hope is that, you know, I, 
like how much I, and I include my wife in this, how much we love him, how proud we are, how much we support him. Like, I don't want that to ever be anything that gives him even a moment's pause. So that's why I say it every day. And it's like, when, as he continues to take on the world, like, just go for it. Like, I don't want anything holding him back. And I never want any doubt. Like, oh, like, my parents support me or whatever. No, it's like, I'm in your corner always. So that, I mean, just in those opening pages, I was like, I was already tearing up. (laughs) I'm tearing up now. I know. Uh, So, yeah, I mean, like, I thought that was great. And then, you know, so again, we open... Uh, we open at the end, and then of course we go back to I think I want to say 1963, where you know we're early uh-huh. in the 60s here, and you know we're with Clark on the farm, and uh, you know we, there's a lot of great you know Jonathan and and Clark scenes. I mean this one in particular, where you know Clark is really feeling held back, you know, kind of confined by this life on the mm-hmm. farm. He you know he wants to get, he wants yeah. to save the world, but you know he doesn't know what that means, and that's I think one of the things that Jonathan is trying to convey. And I really lo- I loved man this this backstory that we get to Jonathan, this, where he recounts his experience in world war. Oh II. yeah. Yeah. What was, what was your take on all of that? I mean, we don't, I mean, I don't read enough Superman comics to know if you've ever re- really heard of any of his backstory, but you know, that time that he spent in Korea or maybe Saigon, wherever it was where they were, you know, they wound up killing a bunch of children or at least that one child at, at that one point. I mean, it was like, you know, powerfully impactful, impactful stuff. And I think that taught him a lot of lessons that ultimately he taught uh, to a young Clark. There was that story. There was also the story um, of the two sailors on the boat, him and like the other guy, and then and they were drowning and they were you know trying to survive. Um, you know, there was so many, and he was telling that story, recounting that story to Lois after he'd heard it from his father. Um, that's not something you're used to seeing from Pa Kent, right? I feel like he was just like a back background character for a lot of it, but here he's at the forefront. And that's where I, where I mentioned it before. It was like this beautiful father son tale. Um, a lot of it, you know, I, I know I said I was going to focus on what I liked, but kind of, mm-hmm. kind of on that note, I think where one of the things that I, I was, I was a little let down by was, you know, we got, we, we get a number of, of Jonathan Pa Kent Clark scenes and that's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, but once Lois and Clark have their son, Jonathan, felt like there was a missed opportunity there. I felt like you didn't really get to see a, nearly enough of Clark, the father, but you know, you get a good bit of Clark, yeah. the son yeah. for sure. But I felt like to kind of tie this all together, that's where I would have liked a little bit more of the emphasis, not so much on what Batman was up to as much right. as the Batman stuff was really interesting, but I yeah. feel like that really could have been its own one shot or a sequel or a companion piece or something. But we, you know, we could talk more about that, but yeah, with Jonathan, I guess what I really, what really resonated with this is, you know, we're not, you know, we're, we're not unaccustomed to the Pa Kent who's reluctant to kind of thrust his son into the world. In most instances, you know, last week on the 100th episode, Ken and I talked about uh, Man and Superman, the rec- relatively recent uh, Marv Wolfman uh, one shot that kind of to- retold Clark's early days in Metropolis. And it was funny in that story, it's like, Ma and Pa are like, shoving him into this get out of the house like, you know pa's like you could do all this you can irrigate you know this uh you know all these deserts you could do this you can do that and ma's yeah. giving him the costume in a in a more i don't want to say aggressive but in a more enthusiastic way than we typically see but the whole idea of pa being reluctant normally it's couched in terms of you know i don't know how the world will receive you you know i don't want you right. to be, you know, to be fearful of it yeah yeah, yeah. But I feel like this, I thought this was really interesting because it's like, you know, again, talking about his experience in the war and this idea of, you, know, you talk about wanting to save the world, but, but you know, a lot of people have wanted to save the world, but you need, essentially need to know how to do that. And then that ties in yeah. great to Clark's uh, early interactions with jor mm-hmm. You know, the first time he finds, uh, the you know, the crystal in the fortress and he meets jor you know, it's this great sequence when Jorel is like, by this point, like I'm sure you've learned everything you can about yeah. Earth and you've yeah. mastered all your powers. And Clark is just like, oh, well, I've not done that. Yeah. Uh, so you know, this just this idea of okay, it's and then it forces him to go, him to go and, back to the farm too. You yeah. Know, which is really funny. It's like, all right, well, I'm not ready. I'm gonna like, you know, maybe f- still be under the tutelage of his uh, of Pa Kent. Maybe I'm not ready. Maybe I should be uh, fearful of that world. Yeah, I mean, so that's such a big theme here about, you know, what it what it actually means, you know, can you save the world and what does that mean? I mean, you know, there's a point later in the story where jor says you can't save the world, right? That's a fallacy to think mm-hmm. you can save mm-hmm. the world. It's about helping people survive it. 
Oh yeah, that's a good one. The other yeah. the other quote that I have written down about that was uh, how men think the world is theirs to save. Yeah, you know, which, which is another great great line. So yeah, thematically that comes up a lot in this, and and how could it not with Superman, right? Obviously the savior of the world. It, yeah, I mean, I it, again, there's so much to there's so much to talk about, and and I guess. Maybe we'll come to a full answer by the time we're done with this about like what what it ultimately was all about. I mean, yeah. I feel like so much of it, you know, one of the other big themes, especially in the in this first issue where it's articulated explicitly, is uh, this notion that that Clark says when he dons the costume for the first time. This is after Kennedy's been assassinated, and um, we have you know Soviet you know subs kind of encroaching you know into into U.S. Mm -hmm. territory, and, and tensions are very high. Um, and actually, no. I'm getting my my timeline mixed up here. This is <laughs> this is later in the story when uh, you yeah. know Lex's plan is in motion and he's detonated uh, those nuclear the warheads bomb. and destroyed yeah. Coast City. Uh -huh. And the United States thinks it's the Soviet Union and they're about to launch their counterattack. And that's when he dons the costume. I caught myself mid sentence. Yeah, but when he dons awesome. that costume for the first time, and he talks about how you know it's not about who's who's most prepared, who's best, who's smartest. It's about who's there, who for shows sure. up. Right. Right. And that's another thing that, again, not, not to make it all about me and being a dad, but I've talked about this yeah. on the show. Like that's kind of the, the driving theme in terms of like everything I'm trying to do is like, just, just be here. It's like, you're not always going to have yeah. the answers. You're not going to always get it right, but like, just, just but be there. there. And I wanted to ask you specifically, especially as, you know, we've talked about New Frontier and, and just kind of your, you know, comics fandom generally here. We got a twist on uh, the Hal Jordan uh, origin uh -huh. story. Where, well, because he was, where, where Evan Sir was basically like, you're not the best, but you're here. Or he says something similar to him, right? Yeah, in that exactly. Moment. What did you think? Not he's, he, well, it was, you know, it fit them thematically with this story. And it, obviously it's a different Earth, so it's not the same Hal Jordan. Maybe in Earth uh, 1, it's he, he was uh, worthy of the ring. But no, I thought that was really, uh, really good. And, and again, it fit in with what we were hearing from Superman the entire time. The heroes are kind of just, when they're needed, they're, they're, they, they, they're there. That's what heroism is all about. Yeah, no, for yeah. for sure. Yeah, I mean, and I don't Jordan, think it was so far away from, from from what it should have been. I think it was okay. Yeah, I mean, look, I think you're right. I, you know, we we can account for a lot of these things. Hey, it's a different Earth, but but even yeah. even putting that aside, you know, just kind of yeah, the this theme of you know just kind of being there, showing up, and for Hal, it was you know in this version of the story, it's not that he was the one without fear. He was just the one it's who the was one there. That shot him down. <laughs> Yeah, yeah <laughs> he shot him down. What are you talking about? Yeah, so, uh, but I don't know. I guess going back to the to the Pa Kent of it all, you know, just kind of you know, him recounting his his war experience, and then like you said, that later story that Clark tells Lois based on what Jonathan had told him about, uh, you know, when 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 he and one of his fellow soldiers, were, you know, were, were trapped in the water, and uh, you know, the guy with him like really kept him going, and you know. As we find out, it told him this lie that oh, this mm -hmm. you know these these other people were able to radio and there's a ship coming and that yeah. that hope that belief that that ship was coming was enough to keep Jonathan alive and and so again this becomes part of one I think the big themes of this of, of what hope means and I guess maybe one of the most common or or most palpable kind of definitions we get is the lie that we make come true. It said twice in this. It said in book two and three, yeah, which is kind of crazy. Um, because you know you don't think about it. I don't know. I never. You, you you kept hearing it come up in this this story. You know the stain of hope, right? What Lois writes the article. Um, this I have a somewhere here. I have like a list of all the times hope is mentioned. Like hope is the castle we all die in. It's like oh my god. Uh, and so like you read these things, you're like, man, maybe I need to redefine what hope is in my life. You know, like um, I don't know. I guess maybe I never really dissected that word and its meaning and and in, in, in an everyday life kind of situation but yeah this story definitely tries to get at the heart of that um and so it's interesting so i don't know it's really interesting so I, again i just started reading crisis and i started putting little tags every time the word hope was mentioned in this and then i stopped because I, I i lost my little thing with all the tags but hope is actually talked about a lot in this and so i don't know if he just recently reread crisis and that comes up a lot but when you read Crisis this summer with, you know, this gigantic summer that you have planned, I think you're going to be surprised on how much the characters keep bringing up the idea of hope. Um, so it must be something I've missed in my life. It fascinating. You know? Well, kind of on that note, let me ask you. So is there anything else as you've been rereading Crisis, anything else that kind of 
illuminated uh, Space Age to, to any extent? No, not necessarily. But I'll tell you, when I started reading Space Age and I saw Pariah, I almost jumped out of my chair. I was like, oh, my God. Because at first, because, like, the Earth is ending. The Earth is always ending in comic books, right? You didn't know that it was ending because, like, the, the worlds were colliding. Uh, and the anti-monitor was doing that. But the second you see Pariah, you're like, holy fuck, what a great idea to set this like comic book series up right at, you know, in the 80s with Crisis. It was such a good idea. Um, uh, I was hoping that by rereading Crisis, I would get like um, kind of some insight into this, but not so much. Um, I think they used just Crisis as like kind of like the backstory of what was going on more than anything. Gotcha. Yeah, But, I mean, but again, know- hope is in it a lot. So you'll see it. You know, so Clark is, uh, you know, first meets Pariah at, uh, you know, we, we see the, the exterior a bunch of times throughout uh, the Seagull Bar and then the Schuster, mm-hmm. the shoe store yeah. Uh, yeah. right yeah. next door. It's really so, good. Of course, on a very nice Really well, well done. Yeah. Uh, but so, you know, so Clark is, wait, you said you didn't catch that? I didn't catch that. That's so great. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the so seag- great. The Seagull and the shoe Ooh. store. So, oh man, I want to go find that right now. Keep going. I'm listening. <laughs> it's in every issue. You'll find it. <laughs> How did I fucking miss that? Oh, there it is. It's so great. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a nice, it's a definitely a nice, it's a nice touch. You know, so, ah, you know, so Clark, well Clark, once he moves to Metropolis and he gets a job at the Daily Planet, he uh, is assigned the Kooks and Cranks beat, uh, taking over for Lois, who now has ascended after her coverage of the JFK uh, assassination. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so, Clark's meeting all of, you know, all these zany people. Uh, and, you know, initially, of course, uh, naturally assumes that Pariah is in that category as he's telling this outlandish story about how he inadvertently unleashed the anti-monitor and he's going to wipe out the multiverse. And we have probably about 20 years left. I have to say, though, because as you know, we've talked about the origin a lot. And one of the things, the Superman origin, one of the things that we always kind of come back to is Clark being a reporter, should it be something that he has a passion for? Should it be something that in most instances we tend to see it's just kind of convenient for him, right? Yeah. It allows him to be in the middle of the action and, you know, maintain his cover, his secret identity because, of course, he'd yeah. be running off into the, into, into the action. I thought the, the track that they took here was, you know, kind of carved out a new, a new path and was a really interesting one where it's not so much – a, a, a cover right or or anything like that it's because this is before he's become superman it's so that he can learn more yeah. right and really engage with humanity in a, on, on a deeper level than he had before again after this very humbling moment where he has this first meeting yeah. with jor-el and realizes with jor-el. like yeah. i haven't done any of the things that jor-el expected <laughs> me to do uh so i really liked i thought that was a really cool a cool angle to take that felt fresh yeah like you said it's this is as good as any way to learn about the people of earth I thought it was fun. Yeah. Now, again, I think one of the other things I bumped up against was, I, I, and this is not the writer's fault. Like this is, I, I guess I had the assumption based on reading the premise of this book before it came out. I guess I thought that this was going to position Clark Superman as, as in a similar position as his father was on Krypton. Like I really thought a lot more of this story was going to be about him trying to convince the world that this crisis was looming, just like Jor-El was trying to convince Krypton that their days were numbered. That would have been a great parallel. Yeah. Again, I, it's, you know, it's just, I guess an assumption that I made, I don't know. And and as I, and I, by the time I got to the end of this, oh yeah, that was not what this was, (laughs) not what this was about. But I feel like that could have been a very interesting road to go down no yeah i mean obviously it would have been wonderful um but at the same time i think he eclipses his father in certain regards not only does he become the scientist but you know the the father can save the one son but in this you know superman then saves the entire world i mean i think that there's some parallels to that origin story he just doesn't have the you know krypton is exploding we should all abandon it i think maybe because of the helplessness knowing that there's no way to save it and this was Superman. He knew how to save it in his own way. No, it's it's true, and and, and it works. And I, and again, I guess maybe that would have been a little bit too on the nose if mm-hmm. it was truly that. Again, he believes that the world is ending, and he's trying to save everyone. I I do think that the story took maybe ultimately it was a more I argue against myself. It took a more interesting track in yeah, and I guess maybe these these more philosophical questions about what it means to save the world. Right. And, yeah. and, you know, his first meeting with Lois, uh, 
I, I thought played great um, where, you know, Superman has just saved the world from an asteroid as he repeats yeah. a few yeah, times. A couple times. Movie. Yeah. Because like Lois is very, you know, Lois is grilling him, right? Essentially yeah. about how, you know, in this timeline, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union have voluntarily uh, disarmed themselves of nuclear mm -hmm. weapons, right? After, uh, and, you know, we'll circle back to Lex, but after his whole plot that nearly instigated this all out nuclear war. Um, they've disarmed themselves. Uh, but now Lois is kind of posing the question, well, you know, before we kind of had, you know, this whole, you know, mutually assured destruction thing, keeping everyone right. in check. Now we don't have that. We just have right. you. You could go off at any moment. Yeah. She needs assurances that he's not going to go off. And so he does. So he provides by the end of that issue, he provides the assurance. You know, he tells them about kryptonite, which I yeah. thought was really nice. That was a great moment. And, I, and before that, too, I think the what jor says to him, I thought that was such a great scene where he's like, you know, they're, it's not that they're afraid of you. It's like they're ultimately afraid of themselves because they are driven by, you know, yeah. <clears throat> greed or ambition or, or, or right. whatever right. you want to call right. it. I'm, pa I'm paraphrasing, but it's kind of like, well, like so, an idea that we've talked about a lot on this podcast, especially in the context of, you know, why would the world be so wary of Superman? Well, mm -hmm. no one can understand why someone would have that power and not misuse it. Because right. virtually exactly. anyone else, if they had it, would. So that's why it's so hard for people to wrap their head around the the concept of a Superman. And so I, I really like kind of that Jor-El piece and then what it leads to. I thought that was cool. Right. Yeah. You know, what what did you think about the the? I mean, I know we're touching on the Superman and Lois of it all. And there's also this great sequence where you get to see like Lois kind of accompanies Superman on like a day in the life, and she gets to see how he's. You know, like there's an old lady who can't get up to her her apartment because mm -hmm. the elevator's yeah. broken, and he flies yeah. her up, and yeah. she makes some tea. Yep. And you know, she's asked Lois is asking these questions essentially about, and even in their first interview, she's like, you know, in the time that it's taking me to answer these questions, it's like all these people have died of disease and starvation. You know, essentially, like, yeah. you know, we the story has kind of been couching it in terms of saving the world, and Lois is like, well, it's, you know, we have to change the world. Right. So you know, bringing up some again a lot of these a lot of these big picture questions, but I feel like Superman's kind of response of this interpersonal, like the small scale giving hope, this lie yeah. that we make come true, like this hope that someone is looking out for me is making a difference. Hey, like, well, how'd you, what was your take on all of that? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I can comment any further. Um, I mean, I, I ultimately, uh, yeah, I don't know. Let's, 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, no, have a rich so, pass. No, that no, one. that's, that's totally fine. No, but so, Again, I just think very interesting. I like the way that played. And, and so let me circle back to my other question for you. How, how well, did you like the way that this story kind of told the Lois and Clark uh, the love story of it all? Oh, for sure. It was really cute. Like, uh, you know, when he when he when he's going to just reveal himself to her and she's like, I'm a reporter. Of course, I know that you're Superman, which is wonderful. Um, and it, it was a really nice moment between the two. You know, obviously, like. It's the same thing. Like, how does Commissioner Gordon not know that Batman is Bruce Wayne? It's one of those things. Like, how could she be like the the great reporter and not know that he's Superman this whole time? Uh, so it was nice to see that. And then they got married. It was beautiful. Yeah, I, don't know. I, I, I think that's kind of the sweet spot. We've talked about this a lot too. As far as you know, I I do tend to gravitate towards more modern tellings like Smallville and like Man of Steel, where Lois is just she's there from the beginning, right? There's mm -hmm. never a point where he's pretending to be two people, but if we are going to have that, I, I like the way it's played here or even in something like Lois and Clark, the new adventures of Superman, where it's like he tells her, but she's already figured it out. And I think that's yeah. probably the best of both worlds because, um, you know, you, you, you want to show <clears throat> that he values and trusts her enough to tell her, but you also want to respect her enough, right. That she's, mm -hmm. that she doesn't need to be told. So I thought that this, yeah. this played nice, yeah. but the thing that, and again, you know, we talked about how kind of Clark as the reporter felt like a fresh spin. The other thing that I really loved, there's a lot that I, that's the thing, there's a lot that I really loved about this story was uh, sort of drawing this parallel between Clark and Lois as as each of them has to be two people, right? They talk a lot about how, and they have this great scene at the bar, the two of them, you know, where Clark always orders his milk. Uh, that's the mm -hmm. only place in the city he can get an, so an ice cute. cold milk. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. Where... You know, you know, Lois is talking about having, you know, being a woman in the newsroom, especially at that time, although I feel like sadly, you know, the story would probably track today as well. But especially at that time, 
uh, when the story is taking place. And I guess that's probably, I want to say that's issue two or in the seventies. I want to say when he stands up for her in the uh, newsroom. Yeah. 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 Uh, such a great scene and then the subsequent scene in the bar where you know she's talking about having to be two different people like there are things she has to mm-hmm. you know she can't show that it bothers her she has to be you know kind of have right. to put up this front and you know both kind of coming to this this understanding and this moment of connection of like just kind of letting each other see one one another for who, for who they are and they have this big kiss in the middle of the bar like I, it was i love that that was great yeah no i mean the, the... The love story between them is always wonderful, but in this one is particularly really nice. So, you know, one of the things that we've kind of been, we've been, we've been touching on, we haven't fully unpacked yet is especially the Batman of it all. We kind of talk about this because Mm -hmm. like I said, some of the things that I've, I've had an issue with, um, the the whole idea, no, go ahead. I was going to say, I thought he was a very interesting inclusion in the first issue, right? So Wayne Enterprises is going to pitch, some military contract against Lex Luthor and Lex Corp. And, you know, it's young Bruce Wayne and he's pitching the idea of fighting, you know, the next wave of, you know, warfare in bat suits essentially, which was really cool. And I thought that was going to be the extent of it. Cause again, ultimately this is not a Batman story. So then when they kept doubling back and doing like the Batman monologue over things, I'm like, well, I don't understand how this is fitting in the overarching story of the Superman. And so, um, but but again, like you said, there are things that really are great about that. Obviously, um, the whole thing with the Joker and you know and money versus life and like what's more important. Um, I don't know. There's some great stuff there, but it just didn't seem like it belonged in this book. And that's 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 my only gripe about the. I mean, I love Batman, but it didn't work. No, I know that's the thing. You're one of the biggest Batman fans. I know we've talked about <laughs> Batman. We, you know, again, we previously we talked about New Frontier in the context of this idea of Superman as a government stooge, right? And both yeah. New Frontier and Dark Knight Returns. And uh, so, you know, I always love getting your take on this. I agree. I think issue one was perfect in terms of how it incorporated Lex and Bruce and this idea of them both vying for this government defense contract. Yeah. And then because it, because it all tied together. And it paid off where, and I I have to say, you know, it's like, uh, this was again, another, I think kind of fresh spin on Lex and his real estate schemes. Right. So like his, his whole plan is (laughs) these bunkers, right. To, to preserve what's left of humanity after the inevitable uh, nuclear war. And, you know, he arranges for this nuclear test. And then of course it's a double cross and he Mm -hmm. detonates these warheads and destroys coast city, poor coast city can never catch a break. I know. And Sam Lane, General Lane is, is, is one yeah. of the casualties. Uh, you know, and, and again, that's what then, you know, would have instigated a nuclear war per Lex's plan, if not for Superman, you know, donning right. the costume and intervening and Batman, uh, you know, t- taking down Lex. So that all worked great. And we end with, you know, uh, the Hall of Justice and the, you know, we see Wonder Woman, we see Flash. We, yeah. Great. But in the subsequent issues, we kept following Batman's story. And, and here's where I keep going back to New Frontier. New Frontier was the sprawling epic that that told you the story of this time from, b- by design, from a variety of perspectives. Right. Different people. This, ostensibly, is a Superman story. Right. Yeah. It's Batman not... has no, yeah, I, I, I 100%. Unless you're going to do another 10 issues where you do The Flash, where you do Wonder Woman and all these people... It doesn't work. And I don't know why it's in there. I really don't get it. That And so like, that's the thing where uh, this was maybe one of the bigger problems I had with this because I felt this really pulled focus from what the story needed to be. And, and like I said, yeah. I, like, like I was frustrated. Where, where were the scenes of Clark, the dad, you know, we get a mm-hmm. little bit of that, but you don't get, I, I feel like nearly as much. And I feel like that you get a snowball estate, thrown scene in the North pole. That's what you get. Yeah, and when he talks about missing Pa Kent, you know, missing Grandpa if yeah. Jonathan dies, like, yeah. but yeah. those moments are pretty fleeting, and I can't help but think that that real estate was dominated by all of these Batman sequences. And and again, it's like, like we're saying, if you're doing a New Frontier esque story and you're going to do all the Justice League characters, great. If this Keep had been coming. called World's Finest Space Age, yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, I don't, I'm I don't with know. you 100. I don't know. Yeah. So that was, honestly, that was a bit of a frustration as much as the bat. Now, all right, putting that aside, did you like, and I guess you've already answered this, but uh, I I guess just what was your reaction to the kind of, 
and again, you can really look at this as just kind of its own little, like you could pull out those pages and just kind of have like a Batman. Yeah, it was like a little one shot. It was great. You, you mean know. you mean the the joke? I thought the treatment of the Joker was wonderful in this. He had a really, uh, really human like response. Like you know, obviously his son had been murdered, and he's going to seek vengeance. And that this seemed like a really big motivation for him to then do what he was doing in this one, where he was stealing the executives of the uh, of Wayne Corp, and he was holding them hostage. And uh, you know, it seemed like a much more rational joker than we're used to which was really great um and i and i love the the interesting scene at the end where he put on the bruce wayne mask and he had batman put on the clown i mean it was great it was such a great scene um and it really tied up the whole batman story there i mean it was just this like you said a, a few pages but um we get to see batman murdered i mean when do you get to see that in, in a comic book really i don't think i've ever seen batman get killed well it, it was bruce wayne at the time but still um, it was, it was, what did you think of it? I mean, I, I really liked it. Oh, well, that's the thing. Uh, you know, in a, in a vacuum, I liked it a lot. Yeah. I didn't dislike it, <laughs> but I did. I, I hated that it was there at the same time. Now in again, devil's advocate in fairness. I mean, I, I, I what I assume the intention was again, kind of tying into this idea of how do you save the world? And I guess you get a few different layers of this because, you know, initially we see Batman's frustration at the Hall of Justice when, you know, everyone's pontificating on what it means to save the world and do we kill, do we not kill, the trolley problem, like all this stuff. Yeah. And for him, it's like, it's not about that. It's about these, you know, kind of these small scale, you know, one person interventions, at a time. like helping people. Yeah. One person at a time. Yeah. Right. Um, which again, kind of, you get that parallel with what Superman expresses to Lois when he, sh you know, explains about right. instilling hope one person at a time. But then, you know, Batman has his journey through this where, you know, he steps down as CEO from from you know uh, Wayne Wayne Tech or Wayne Wayne Corp. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess they shift from being a defense manufacturer to real estate developer. They're quite versatile. Yeah, yeah, they do a lot with the, mm -hmm. under Max Lord's uh, direction. Yeah, right. So under Maxwell Lord, yeah, another real estate scheme here. He's building expressways and suburbs, and yeah. he's burning Gotham down uh, in order to, <laughs> to drive people out to drive people out of the city. And you know, Batman Again, then I not guess, on Earth. I guess Batman then has this this realization of like, well, I've been focusing on. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but kind of like focusing too small scale, right? Like there are these mm -hmm. larger. I've turned a blind eye. Like I stepped down from Wayne Corp, and this is not, you know, on the street is not. I guess not necessarily where the war is won, right? You know, he talks about this idea yeah. of the suit, like it's waged in these polyester suits, not in the right. you know the yeah. armored suits. Yeah. So, you know, he kind of goes back and forth, too, as far as, I guess, where the the focus ultimately needs to be. Again, there's a lot of interesting stuff, and there are parallels, but it was just, I, like I said, it pulled focus, at least for me. I mean, they I'd be curious done the to parallels hear without, Yeah, they could have done the parallels without the focus that they, they devoted to him, to him. Yeah. I mean, I also wonder, too, if the story had been kind of built to allow for more interaction between the two of them. Then, then I feel like maybe this would have been more justified, but it just really felt like that... The Batman stuff was kind of like its own little silo here, mm -hmm. and and you know it it didn't feel like it was as seamlessly woven in with the rest of it. Has this guy written a lot of hardcore DC stuff? You know, I'm not positive his full bibliography. He wrote the Flintstones when they when DC did the Hanna Barbera stuff. He did right, the Flintstones. Right. He's done some. I mean, I, you know, I, I I don't know offhand. Uh, not not a ton, as far as I know. All right. Well, let's get back to the idea of you know artists really wanting to be artists and writers really wanting to be in the Batman universe. Right. And this is his chance. This is his one shot at the moment. Just like, you know, with Jonah Hex, we're saying you got one shot. He's using his one shot and giving us a Batman story that was well done, you know, and, and again, it fit in there. It, it might've been forced in, but it fit in. Right. But it just, it didn't, it wasn't necessary. And I think that was what, I think everybody who reads this will probably see that as well. It was just like, why is this, you know, if, if this book ultimately is in Superman's kind of head, you know, in his monologue as he's writing this journal, how does it ever shift to the Bruce Wayne? It just doesn't make sense um, in that regard. You mentioned Jonah Hex. So audience, uh, Bill and I, uh, before we recorded this, we recorded the next episode of the Patreon exclusive Digging for Justice, where we go through all of the non-Superman DC movies. And we did an episode on the much maligned Jonah Hex film from 2010. Uh, so that's available the first Friday of May. I hope you will check it out. Patreon.com slash Anthony Desiato available at all levels, $1 and up. 
You can do a free trial. You can do a discounted annual membership. You can do a regular monthly membership. Uh, it really helps support the show and allows me to uh, cover all of the costs associated with it. And you get perks like extra episodes. So I hope you'll check it out. And I greatly appreciate everyone uh, who is a patron or has been a patron. Uh, really, really means a lot. Again, even if nothing else, do a free trial. Check it out. See if you like it. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree. You know, I, I, I agree with all of that. And again, like I said, that like totally interesting kind of in its own right. As far as the other DC characters, none of them get this level of treatment. But uh, again, we see Wonder Woman. We, I mean, we talked about Hal Jordan and how he becomes Green Lantern. He meets a very untimely end at the hands of Brainiac uh, at the uh -huh. end of issue two, uh, and then is later replaced by Jon Stewart. Uh, we, you know, we see Green Arrow, we see Aquaman. We, you know, we later on, we see, you know, kind of a whole pantheon. But I, I gotta say, man, I loved, I loved how they treated Flash in this. What did you Building think? the bottles? Building yeah. the, uh, the ships in the bottle? He's like, I built 10 today. <laughs> That, but the bomb, but the more than that, the bombs. This oh, whole idea okay. that yeah, like yeah. he's practicing how to how to deactivate the, bombs. Well, live bombs right there in the uh, yeah. But he's like, you know, they always call me like when there's <laughs> when there's a bomb. He's like, I show up and then I'm just running around holding a bomb, like yeah. trying to bring it someplace. He's like, I figured I should learn <laughs> yeah, how, I gotta to learn how to one of these. Yeah. <laughs> it's really good. And then I gotta say, man, one of my favorite favorite moments in this whole thing in issue two, towards the end, when they're fighting Brainiac. And there's this moment where like Superman and Flash are on the ground and, and uh, I forget exactly what Flash says, but Superman says to him essentially like, you're not much good for, for anything, are you? Like, he, like <laughs> he's kind of putting Flash down. And then Flash is like, oh, but by the way, like I put all I of put these, these bombs, bombs in a ship. <laughs> you meant you do that. He's like, oh, well, we're just sitting down. <laughs> and then Superman's like, well, how do you, how do you detonate? Them? He's like, you know, I don't really know. I've really been focusing on, <laughs> on the, on diffusing them. <laughs> It was great. Oh man. Yeah. He was good. Uh, yeah. I, you know, it's funny as like, as we're talking about this, if we were in charge of DC, I mean, I feel like as we've talked about at length already, the Batman stuff could have been its own one shot. I would have happily mm -hmm. read a whole flash space age one shot. Oh my I feel God. Like yeah. Maybe that could have been the structure for something like this. I feel like it could have, yeah. you know, they could have made even more of a meal out of one this shots of each one of them that all tie together somehow, you know, would have been great. Was there any character again, flash, even though he doesn't get his own one shot, does get the play that we talked about. Is there anyone else like wonder woman, like green arrow where you're like, Oh man, I really would have wanted more with this version of them. Not necessarily, but I was very excited to see it. One of the scenes he had the doom patrol, he had our man. And these are characters that Mike Allred loves. And so I wonder how much of it was his input. Like if I can draw anybody in the world, I'm going to put like the characters he loves. Because again, anybody who read DC Solo, I mean, obviously he had uh, the Doom Patrol meeting the Teen Titans. He had the Arrow Man uh, segment. And so Wait, I really that feel like the, that. That was the one, right? That was his issue yeah. of Solo where Arrow Man yeah. takes the pill. but then... He takes the pill and he's like walking dogs, painting the house. <laughs> so when I saw him in this, I'm like, oh, this is definitely Mike Allred throwing Arrow Man in there. <laughs> oh, that's so, so great. Yeah, again, like I said at the top, you know, I know how much you love how dialed in you are to the art now and that you're a fan of all right in particular. Yeah. I mean, what, yeah. is there anything that you saw, saw him doing in this that particularly stood out to you or any sequences or anything that just, you were really struck by on the art side? You know what? When I read this again, I'll probably pick up on a lot of that. And, uh, I know we had a deep discussion with, uh, when we read the long Halloween, I picked up a lot of the Tim sale artwork and some of the sequences, some of the shadowing work he did. Uh, nothing stands out to me at the moment. Uh, other than it was just a really clean, you know, you knew you were reading a Mike Allred book, which was great. He wasn't trying to be anybody else but himself. And and it's really rare that you see him doing this kind of superhero work, which was really great. Um, and so it worked. I think it really worked with this story. But again, it worked because, again, I think as I'm reading this, I'm thinking of Darwin Cook. And there's some parallels between that cartoony style and his kind of his art style as well and so you mentioned you wanted to double back to the uh the new frontier stuff huh yeah what do you think is, do you think this oh. is falling short because ultimately it couldn't do what they were doing okay so this is as good as time as good a time as any like some of the other kind of things that I, i've been grappling with so and this is not confined to new frontier i i guess as the saying goes like there are no new ideas but i i guess I, I don't, I'm not, I, I, I'm not saying, oh, this is derivative, but mm -hmm. there were a few instances where I felt like, okay, the whole idea of setting the story against 
the the, the backdrop of real world U.S. history. You know, we saw done masterfully in New Frontier, mm-hmm. the whole bit about Superman uh, curing all disease. We saw in All Star Superman, which also dealt with similar themes of Superman grappling with his impending end. You know, again, mm-hmm. in All Star Superman, it was specific, personal to Superman. Here, it's the whole world, but still, it's kind of the same idea. Uh, so again, I, I guess there's a part of me that's like, oh, like there's some really cool stuff. Even the passing of Jonathan Kent, you know, that that's always going to evoke, uh, an emotional response from me. But at the same time, we've, Mm -hmm. again, it's nothing that we haven't necessarily seen in Superman, the movie in all-star Superman. So, uh, so I guess that's kind of where, where I, you know, I had maybe a, a little bit of an issue. I mean, again, I think this stands on its own and it's distinct, but, I, I guess there were a few instances where I felt like, okay, you know, I feel like I've seen versions of this. Do you not feel that this was like a love song from uh, from the writer to, you know, for, for all that stuff that he loved in comics, you know, incorporating them all into his work? Um, yeah. Into now one story. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously it's hard to not be derivative. It's hard not to, you know, when you're using this character that has a specific origin that when you, def- you know, when you you know, start straying from that origin, like Frank Miller does, that it, it fans erupt. And so, you know, you have to like, you know, if you're going to make some changes, you got to have like these baby changes, maybe make sure it harkens back to something that's done already. Um, so I think he does that and still is able to, you know, tell a unique story. Um, but again, it's a love letter to his probably the 60s and, and the 70s and the 80s that he grew up in, um, combined with all these stories that you just mentioned, you know. Yeah. Which is totally, and that's the thing, that's, you know, that that's that's totally fine. I guess maybe because I've been covering so much of this and thinking about all this, you know, for this concentrated period of time, it's just, maybe it dulls the impact a little bit where it's like, okay, like I, I mean, I don't know, sure. on the one hand, you can look at it as, oh, it, it it could enhance the reader's appreciation because you know what it's pulling from. But on the other hand, it's kind of like, okay, like, I, you know, like, I see. Yeah, uh, yeah. But as far as well, I, what I did want to ask you specifically on this whole like new frontier esque idea of pulling in, weaving in U.S. history, or world history. I mean, I guess anything you want to say about that generally, but specifically, you know, was there any sort of historical aspect moment uh, that that you were that you found particularly interesting? Like, you know, we find Lois broke the Watergate story. Like, were there was yeah, there anything yeah, that, that was really, so great? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, because like Clark Clark didn't want to deal with it, right? Because it was like. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, whatever. Um, no, not necessarily. I just, I, I mean, I think ultimately it really sets the tone for the the story really well that you're, you know, that you're within history, not only the comic book history, because this is the retelling of the, the Justice League, Superman growing up and everything else, but it's set in a backdrop of something that we're all familiar with. And I think that ultimately it takes you out of the comic book, but keeps you in there knowing that it's like, his, you know, these historical events that are there. Um, I don't remember them all offhand. That's the problem. Um, where I would comment on them more. No, that's totally obviously fine. the JFK, like you said, and the uh, the Watergate, but and the civil rights movement. The fact that you know uh, Lois gets arrested with these others, you know, uh, the Freedom Riders, and and she's oh yeah, and that she was story. in the jail with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know, I think that like that aspect was uh, you know was was definitely interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed that how that played out for sure. What else? Where else what should else? We go? Yeah, where else? Where else should we go? <laughs> um, you know, again, I think my my favorite thing, and again, maybe it's because I'm a father, like you were saying that you were a father, is it's that father son stuff, and some of the things that Jonathan said to him were great. Like, like one of the lines that I really love from this book was, but when he's talking about saving the world fast, he's like, save it quick or save it right, and I just love that. And ultimately, in this, you get to see, I think, Superman saving it right instead of trying to save it quick. Um. I think that was a really great moment. Any any of the Jonathan Clark scenes in this was just so good. Yes, I never fell in love with him as a character until this book. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. Oh, right shucking on. corn. You know, you can't just shuck corn and not think about old Pa Kent. That's great. I know. <laughs> no, that and also, you know, I know we mentioned this before, but when he's you know telling Clark the whole story of being in the war and what he went through and inadvertently killing that kid and and how it haunted uh-huh. him and and everything and and how. Not, not that we ever necessarily needed an explanation for, oh, why is Jonathan Kent a farmer? But when he's like, you know, when I got back, I just wanted to watch things grow for a while. Yeah. yeah. You know, it was a, a really uh, poetic sentiment. I really like that a lot. Yeah. 
Oh my God, yeah. The other thing he says in that scene, right, is like I think it's that scene, or maybe not. He he says sometimes the dead disappear because we need them to. That's the price of our survival. It's like holy crap, it's so deep. There are so many things in this story that were just so well thought of, um, and it's rare from a, for a writer who previously did the Flintstones. <laughs> Again, he's. The, I don't want to make. I don't want to like. Say, I, I know. I don't know one, enough about it. I'm sorry if, if <laughs> one Mark Russell, if you're listening to this, I'm really sorry. I really loved it, but yeah, it's like this is profound stuff, which I thought was really beautiful. Um, this was not just him sitting at a computer late at night writing a Superman story. I mean, this is well thought out. Um, as disjointed as time as it, it might have been, and again, I think it's because he might have had. Well, maybe I have a 12-issue miniseries on my hands, but DC probably is like, well, do it in three issues, and we'll make you a prestige format. You know, that's probably the best they gave him, and he tried to maybe truncate his original idea. So maybe he really did have the idea to do little stories of all the Justice League members, but he just couldn't do it. And these were on the cutting room floor kind of thing. Perhaps. I could, maybe. Yeah, I, oh, you know, it's funny. I feel like I read something online. It's about what the original, I, I about what the original format of this was going to be. And I don't know if it was that it was going to be longer or so. I, I'd have to double check, but I think there was, I don't think it was originally meant to be three 80 page issues. Okay. So maybe there, you know, there was a, a different original idea, but you know, one of the things that not even necessarily a critique, but more just kind of like I was thinking about this after Luther's ploy where he destroys Co City and tries to start this nuclear war and Superman dons the costume and he intervenes and he mm -hmm. stops the American nuclear missiles from hit from hitting the Soviet Union, right? Right. And then the two countries decide themselves to disarm. Right? Mm -hmm. Not not I you know, again, I guess this territory has been covered in Superman 4, The Quest for Peace, also in the King of the World storyline from the Triangle Era, which we just covered a couple of episodes ago. But I wonder if it might have been interesting to explore, well, what if they didn't take it upon themselves, right? Like there's so much talk about how Superman is going to save the world. Well, it's like, well, would he take all of the nuclear weapons? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Like, I feel like it's the story kind of gave him an out, whereas like, <laughs> the country yeah, decided he didn't have to, to now themselves. collect up. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so it's like, well, well, what would they have, you know, what would the reaction have been? Uh, if Superman know, had, just came in, disarmed them. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's, you know, he's, he's like, I have to save the world. And this is how I think it's, right. it's this best is it, to do. Yeah. You know, but again, obviously they, you know, they, they, they pursue this different avenue. Uh, one of the, going back to where we started with this whole idea of like, what is this ultimately about? What is this trying to say? And I guess one of the things I keep coming back to is just kind of how, I don't want to say meaningless, but <laughs> like random. Life is? Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's kind of one of the, one of the things at the heart of all of this way, you know, again, yeah. hope is the lie that we make come true. Again, the whole thing with, you know, Jonathan uh, in that shipwreck, right. And just kind of the belief that this boat was coming was enough to make him mm -hmm. hang on until it got there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, and just other ideas too, about how, you know, you know, impossible it is that we're even here to begin with and how precarious it all is. And, and we see, you know, earth, what is it? Earth Z? The other, the earth, you know, the other earth yeah. that everyone yeah. eventually ends up on, you know, there it's, it's a Superman who's totally alone. That universe is brainiac has stripped oh. the world of its natural resources and, and everything. Right. I, now my understanding wasn't that brainiac had eliminated all the people. It seemed like that had already happened. And then he stripped what was left. It was a nuclear war. He said that yeah. it was, it was more common to find earths that uh, destroyed themselves and not is what yeah. he said. Gotcha. Okay. Which so, so yeah, this idea of just like how impossible it is to be here at all, how how quickly it can all disappear, how again, it's not who's best, who's smartest, who's most prepared, it's just who sh who shows up. Uh, yeah. you know, we tell ourselves these lies that then become truth because we believe them. Um, yeah. even even the flip of that, right? Where Lois tells a story of her father in World War II, right? And that bridge yeah. that the Americans and the Germans were yeah. fighting they were to all the thought death they were fighting this important thing. Yeah. Right. And it, that gave it meaning because they, they believed it had that meaning. So I'm going to use another television reference. And I know I've used this before on the show too, but it's something that, uh, I, I don't know. I've, I, I, it's always, it's always at the top of mind, especially when we're talking about things like this. Did you watch Brooklyn nine, nine by any chance? Uh -uh. Okay. No, I never did. So, uh, Andre Brower, he plays the captain there. Great character, great show. And they did a crossover with new girl, uh, on Fox at one point. And anyway, 
Uh, so uh, the Zoe Deschanel character from New Girl is having a crossover okay. scene with Captain Holt. And he says, you know, everything happens for a reason. And then she launches into this whole thing about like, yes, everything happens for a reason. And, and she like rattles off like how she ended up where she ended up. And then he goes, no, no, no. What I was going to say was everything happens for a reason. And that reason is random chance. Yeah. And I think about that a lot. It's like, you yeah. know, things just happen. And it's like we ascribe meaning to them, right? Like we have this hope and and it allows us to carry through and we make it true. You know, it, it, you know, again, so like we're kind of imbuing a lot of these things with meaning, but a lot of it is just kind of like what happens and you make the best and you help the old lady get up to, you know, to her floor yeah. when the elevator's you out. Make some and, tea. Yeah. But it's just kind of all <laughs> meaningless, but. Yeah. I, and in and, and an instant, it could be gone, you know? Yeah. And that's really where this heads. This, this story heads headlong into nothingness, you know, all these lives that people have just ultimately, uh, What's it all about? Yeah. yeah. So maybe that is. I mean, it's very profound what you uh, are talking about right now. And I see it. I think that's probably what is mean, you know, meant to convey. And it's it's coping with life, right? How do people cope with life knowing that it's just randomness? There's just all these events. Um, you know, I think they say something like that, too, in the book. Something like the things you love or, you know, help you get through the struggle of life or something like that. Whatever it was. Um, Oh yeah. yeah, it's a bleak look. Oh yeah, oh that's. A, I'm glad you mentioned that. I forget the context or who said it, right? But the yeah, it's like these things aren't distractions, right? Like they just they yeah, help that's you. right. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, that they just they help you get through. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. I think that's what so much of this comes down to. And then you have again, in fairness, to give kind of you know to explain like the Batman piece of it. You know, you get Batman's approach to this. You see Superman's. One of my favorite, other favorite moments in this was when Lois is interviewing Superman and, and he's like, well, what would you do? Like if mm-hmm. you were me to save the world? And she's like, well, I don't want to sound arrogant, but I feel like I am saving the world and <laughs> like, what I'm doing as a journalist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is so, a scene where they're on the roof and he's holding the flowers the whole time, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's funny. Yeah. I guess that's not, yeah, not to nitpick, but like, that's one of the other things I feel like there was so much great Lois stuff especially early on, I feel like. Oh, yeah. When she's reading that article that she writes, The Stain of Hope, it's like, oh, my God, this is so good. I feel like once they get yeah. married and then they're living you at the fortress, but she's still, but they're yeah. still reporters. Yeah, I feel like they kind of, uh, she kind of fades a little bit. I could have, I would have liked a little bit more of a focus there. You know? I would like to, if he's ever at a you know convention, I'd love to hear him talk about this because I would love to hear what his idea of what he wanted to tell in this story versus what he started out telling. Because uh, ultimately, I think in the end, it's not as cohesive um, as maybe the beginning was. I think he really had a strong start, and he knew what he wanted to do. Maybe he had it laid out. And I think that first issue really just it, it speaks volumes towards that that idea. And then like how he had to change maybe his vision. And so maybe Lois did have a much bigger role um, throughout, because she definitely does uh, early on. But you're right, when she has the jo- little bit little Jonathan, she kind of fades away. I also have to say, in fairness, um, one thing that was kind of cool was reading this was I didn't know how it was going to end, you know, because all of these things, most of the things I've been covering on this podcast, I mean, in in many instances, I've already read or watched them. Mm. And even when I have been coming to something new, more often than not, you know, it's been around for so long. It's like I've been spoiled, right? I know what happens. You've heard about it. Yeah. You know, this was recent enough where, and I, I purposely avoided, you know, reading too much. And so, I, you know, I remember sitting there last night and I was about to crack open the third one. And I actually kind of, not maybe not unlike yourself, where, you know, like we were putting it down and coming back to it. You know, I kind of like, I waited a little bit, you know, going yeah. back to uh, our, our old comic shop, Alternate Realities, and, and our, our former boss, Steve Odo. Uh, you know, I know you know this, but shows that he loves. Like some of his favorite shows like West Wing and Buffy, well, he's not seen the final episodes because yeah. he knows yep. once he watches those, it'll, it'll really be over. And so in his yeah. mind, it's like, they're still not over. Yep. And so I guess there was like a little bit of that where I didn't want it to end, but also it's like, I didn't. And it was a, it's a feeling like, like I said, I just, I, I haven't had in a while where it's like, I, yeah. and I purposely, I was like, don't flip through it because I was so yeah. tempted. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, don't do it. 
And I was literally like turning those pages and it was, it was a cool, you know, it was a cool experience to kind of have that, that kind of feeling again. Yes. It's a rare feeling nowadays. And I did my best to not read anything about this online for that same reason. Um, I kind of wanted to be surprised by the ending. If, and maybe you've already answered this. I, I could probably guess, you know, from somewhere where we started here, but I mean, if, Superman and the other heroes had find a, had found a way to stop the anti-monitor or save humanity, you know, it, it, it through means other than, you know, the, the, the quote unquote cloning business we talked about. Mm -hmm. If it had been more of a traditional save, more of a traditional happy ending, do you think that that would have been off? Like, would that have robbed the story of, of kind of its more fundamental meaning? Yeah, I think so. Because obviously crisis, right? Only one world survives, right? Or two? I don't even remember. That's why I'm rereading it. Um, I think ultimately knowing that this this story came came out of that, knowing that all these you know infinite Earths had all you know died off or or were erased by the Anti Monitor, it needed to end that way. Um, and that that was kind of again, it was the the balance to the hope that they were talking about the whole time. It was the hopelessness of it all. You know, it's so funny, and I, I know I, I what? was getting at this earlier, but like. As you're saying this, it's it, you're saying it's it's so matter of fact. It makes all the sense in the world, right? Clear yeah. again. This is against the backdrop of crisis. We know from crisis most of the universes are destroyed. But again, I I guess I just wasn't taking it as literally as I was yeah. reading this. It was more, yeah. I guess I was taking it more in a you know in a in a in a, in a looser or spiritual sense. It's like oh yeah, it's crisis. Like in my mind, it wasn't like well, of course this right. Earth has to die because we know that most <laughs> of the Earths die. But it's like yeah. when you say it like that, it's like well, duh. It's like yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's okay. <laughs> but no, like it. Yeah, it's like no, of, of course it. It had it. To, it yeah, yeah, it had it. Yeah. But I, at the same time, you wonder if that Earth Z right is there a world out there right now? Another world. It's that's you know it's provocative to think about. Yeah, I, I suppose. Or did hey, Anti Monitor just wipe that out too? We don't know. So it doesn't matter if they don't have souls; they didn't last long. Well, that I guess that is one of the other things, and I think this has been. It might have even been on Tyler's podcast or one one of the other. I saw this floating around outline online where, you know, a big part of the story is the brainiacs of the multiverse, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to recruit yeah. our Superman, just our Superman. They don't really want anybody yeah. else but they just to try that. to. <laughs> to try to launch this assault against the anti monitor. I liked Brainiac being positioned as an unlikely ally savior in this sure. context. But uh it, you know, they like Brainiac, the Brainiacs have this ultimate plan, and obviously the Earth that we're following, they fall. You know, it's one of these things, do we just assume that their plan eventually worked and Earth Z makes it, or are they doomed too? <laughs> it's Right. You know, that's a that's a particularly bleak way of looking at this because it ends on this hopeful note, but it's like, well, maybe they won't last too long either. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I know. know. I don't know. I don't know. Where were they keeping all those resources, by the way? They're stripping all these Earths from their resources. I don't know. They're just floating heads in space. How big are those heads? Yeah, that's a, I know. That's a good question. You know, it's typically like knowledge that they want or entire cities, not just minerals. So, yeah, I don't know. Uranium. But, Maybe that's just what fuels their ships. Maybe maybe that's yeah, all it possible. is. I don't know. But that's a good question too. Yeah, I, you know, going back to, I, I don't mean to, I, I, people must be like, man, this guy's obsessed with television. Because <laughs> one other, <laughs> and I know I've talked about this too, but I, you know, I guess these these come up from time to time, especially when we're talking about these these big picture, these philosophical, these religious ideas, because these were things that I guess really like really made an impression on me. I know I've talked about this, but in uh, Angel, I just mentioned Buffy a minute ago, but in Angel, one of the episodes where, um, you know, they're, uh, they think they're going down to hell, but then like the elevator doors open and they're just on earth. And it's this whole idea that um, like, this is really all there is. And Angel, what Angel articulates at the end of that episode is if nothing we do matters because there's nothing beyond this world. Like if nothing we do matters in terms of determining heaven or hell or anything like that, then all that matters is what we do. And I remember as even as like a, I guess I was in early college when I was, when I watched that. And I just remember, I was like, well, that makes like kind of all the sense in the world to me. And it's like, that's why, you know, we should try to be good and help people here. Not because mm -hmm. of, an, of a reward that we're hoping for in the afterlife, but sure. it's because just for its this own sake, because this is all yeah. there is. And maybe yeah. that's another way to look at all of this. It's like, you know, all of these efforts to, to save, to help, whether it's, you know, uh, Bruce Wayne in the boardroom, Batman in the streets, 
uh, you mm-hmm. know, everything that Superman does over the course of the story, big and small, it's just, it's all there is. Like, that's just it. So, uh, again, once again, television helps uh, <laughs> kind of <laughs> like frame a lot of this, but I, I guess I always kind of go back to, to a lot of those ideas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it supports or um, goes against your, do these people have souls in the end argument? I don't know what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, here's another question, and I say this somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but after Pa passes, right, there was this undiagnosed heart condition, right, that if they had known, they would have been able to save him, but they didn't. Uh, it's immediately after that that Superman starts studying the human genome, mm-hmm. right, and comes yeah. up with this chewable tablet that can cure any disease. Yeah. Did it? Again, very all-star Superman-esque, where in that story, with the help of the miniaturized Kandorians, cures all disease on Earth one of his legendary 12 labors. But here, you know, it's like he only thinks about that after, after Pa dies. I I, I don't mm-hmm. know. Not, not that it, not that it diminishes what he ultimately does. And and I guess right. it makes sense that such a personal, you know, palpable you know, connection would inspire it. But I don't know. I guess part of me just felt like, well, hey, why, you know. You should have been doing this whole time. Well, but also because, like, this, we've, he's been talking so much, right, about, like, how he's going to save the world. And Lois, again, in that first interview, makes that whole that whole bit about, hey, in the time that it's taking for me to say this sentence, all these people, all these are, people dying. are dying. Yeah. So I guess that's the, I guess I just wonder, I feel like that maybe could have been whether, you know, again, disarming the world of nuclear weapons if they had gone down, gone down that route or, you know, in that conversation with Lois, it's like, well, yeah, why don't you try to cure the world of, of of starvation, you know, or disease. Yeah. It's like, again, yeah. he eventually gets there, but I feel like the question was, was begged far earlier. So I don't know. Well, he wasn't there in his journey yet, you know? And then certainly Pop Kent, you know, drove him there. Um, you know, the death of the father figure always seems to be important to some of these superheroes, right? Yeah, no doubt. How did you like the way the story uh, uh, positioned Luther uh, in these proceedings? In terms of, in terms of what? I guess just in terms of his the the characterization and and his objectives. Yeah, I, I mean some of the characterizations I love great. I mean I loved when he like got out of jail uh, after what twenty years he was in jail, and then he's like the stocks are down and whatever, and the guy's like, oh we're not selling enough shampoo. He's like, what does it say on the label? Oh just add repeat. I doubled your profits. <laughs> it's like <laughs> that's hilarious. He has some really funny scenes in that regard, um, but I don't know. I don't know what else I can comment on Luther. Yeah, no, I, the Luther part was interesting. It's funny because uh, as we're recording this literally today, uh, again, a couple weeks from when people are listening to this, but uh, today the CW uh, put up a trailer uh, for Superman and Lois featuring the debut of their version of Lex Luthor played by Michael oh, Cutlitz okay. from Walking Dead and Southland oh, okay. and, and other stuff. And it looks very badass. I'm very excited for this yeah. new take on Lex. But in that, in this context, he's leaving prison after 20 years. So, you know, okay. <laughs> good enough oh, to see that, that parallel. But yeah, I mean, the, like the Lex of it all. I mean, we talked about the real estate scheme and all of that. Great lines. I agree. The lather, rinse, repeat was terrific. Yeah. In the first issue, someone mentions luck. He's like, luck is the prayer of children and gamblers. And I was like, that's yeah. a great line. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I like that. And I, I guess the two. I guess the t- the two things about Lex that stand out the most are, you know, when he gets out of prison and he's making his plans to kind of take over. I, guess, I think it's Otis who, or one of his underlings, <clears throat> who sort of you know broaches this idea of revenge against Superman. Yeah, and he's like, what? What? <laughs> yeah, and the absurdity of doing it, right? Because then they bought all the kryptonite, right? They could have bought. Yeah. Yeah, and Lex says something to the effect of like, what, like, like. What am I on the like the schoolyard playground? Like it's yeah. so like yeah. it, which I thought was just kind of again like I keep using this term of fresh spin, but it's like okay, like that's a cool, mm-hmm. you know, kind of twist on the tip. Yeah, that wasn't dynamic. his motive. His motive wasn't taking down Superman in this. And and again, sort of tying into this idea of the meaninglessness of everything, <laughs> where Lex's yeah. story ultimately ends. Oh, this I thought like this really played great. I thought where he through you know, some pretty creative legal gymnastics is able to get himself released from prison after 20 years, mm. right? After killing millions of people. Yeah. It was the accident. Uh, it was an accident. Yeah. The the government gave him these bombs to test. They just went off. Yeah. You know, we find out he's ultimately behind this new, you know, the, the Joker and the death of Bruce Wayne. And then that allows right. him to take control of Lex Corp. Wayne Corp. Yeah. 
Uh, Wayne Corp, thank you. Uh, he's yeah. been buying up all these pharmaceutical companies who have been devalued yeah. because of Superman's you know, new Hill. drug. Yep. And yep. then he's like, well, now all we have to do is convince the government yep. to make Superman's you know, disease-curing tablet yep. illegal. Mm -hmm. And it's like all the pieces are falling into place, and he couldn't be happier with himself. And then he looks out the window. He's like, what's going on? What's supposed to <laughs> The sky is white, whatever. Yeah, it's ending. And I thought that yeah. was such a, like... Man, just such a, I don't know. The world can end tomorrow for any fitting, of us. Yeah, but yep. just like a fitting poetic end. Like this guy is poised to get everything that he wanted just as yep. everything's about to end. And just that moment of like, hey, what's going on? Like yeah. he's just so focused on this singular selfish objective and it's it's all for naught. Or not. Yeah. Because all that matters is what you do. So for him, yeah. he fulfilled. You know what? I don't know. That's a. I, I'm kind of posing, figuring yeah, out this question. There's the no moment. afterlife, right? If there's no afterlife, he did right by himself, right? Whatever. Yeah. Did he fulfill everything that you know? Like, I, you know, that's he accomplished everything that he wanted to, even if then there was no tomorrow. Yeah. So yeah, it was a cool. I thought it was a cool, uh, a, a, a cool take on Lex. I mean, at the same time, for again, if we're talking real estate in this book. The, the return of Lex could maybe fall into the Batman category where it was cool mm -hmm. in and of itself, but probably could have lifted right. out and have had more of like the Superman family life. But, you know, but it, but again, I thought it was, it was cool and definitely worked. Yeah. I mean, obviously I think all of these were in juxtaposition to Superman and his life, right? How, how he was different in, than both Batman, Lex, Brainiac and all these characters. Yes. And, you know, very recently, I, I, it's funny, I can't even remember offhand if this happened in time for, that we mentioned it in the last episode or not, but they, uh, we did talk about it, but it, uh, I'll mention it again because it's, it's uh, while we're talking about Lex, uh, the, the long-awaited spiritual follow-up to Superman Birthright by Mark Wade and Brian Hitch, The Last Days of Lex Luthor. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, I don't know if you've followed any of this, but the premise is that Lex is dying and he wants Superman to save him and Superman is willing, but the world is like, what are you doing? Uh, saving Lex Luthor, but he's committed to this. And, and so, uh, I don't know, I, I, as we're talking about like all these philosophical, uh, ethical questions, I think that'll be, that'll be a fun one to dive into when we get there. For sure. Is there anything else that uh, stood out to you about this? Anything else you had in your notes that we didn't talk yes. about that you wanted to? Yes. Yes. So let me just flip through this really quick. Right. And so one of the things I find interesting in this, right, is that, you know, it goes back and forth. Here's Smallville, Kansas, you know, we're in Saigon, I think this is. You know, we're in Metropolis. We're in Gotham City. There are two places, or one place, I should say, that was mentioned twice in this. That doesn't make any sense. Do you remember? Nah, draw on a blank. What? New Mexico. Why is New Mexico where I live right now? Oh, that's right. <laughs> they, they got a lot of real estate in this. Twice they were mentioned. Uh, which I thought was really funny. Once when when Superman had the pill, the other time when uh, he brought that 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 pimp to New Mexico, uh, it was kind of funny to see it brought up twice. I think the pimp ultimately becomes the lab tech, and I think that's why it was mentioned the second time. But I just thought even one time was kind of strange. Oh, I didn't so even I don't pick know. up on that. I need to learn. I got to research the uh, the connection between you know whoever on that creative team in New Mexico. There's no yeah. New York, for example. There's no California. There's New Mexico. Nice. So. Well, I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're. Uh, right. your, your home. Shout out to my adopted state. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I like that. I know. I definitely remembered. Yeah, when he when he flies the pimp there, but I had forgotten the sort of the other reference. Oh, that's cool. What else? Yeah, that that was it. That's all I had for that. Um, I don't know. I mean, there were so many lines that I highlighted that I could. I you know we could talk about, but I think ultimately it just feeds into the same stuff that we've talked about, you know, about like the hopelessness of things, some stains you just carry with you. I mean, there's so many things. This, this, anybody who wants to read a really great Superman story, read the first issue of Space Age. You know, it's just a well-written book. Yeah, it's, you know, this was, it was definitely a lot of, I really enjoyed the reading of it, regardless of whatever, you know, issues I might have had, but I really enjoyed it and it was fun to talk about. And, you know, just kind of, circling back, I really do think, you know, it's interesting in talking about this because again, unlike a lot of other things that we've talked about, you know, it's my, you know, my opinions on this, 
and I suspect yours as well. So we just read it for this. You know, they're not fully mm. settled yet. You know, a lot of times yeah, we're talking right. about stuff. It's like, well, I grew up reading these stories. I've yeah, been I read this twice. Yeah, yeah. You know? yep. It's like, I just read this. And so, uh, you know, kind of what you're hearing, what you've heard in this episode, and I hope it's been enjoyable, is like I've, almost as spontaneous as it gets. I mean, I finished yeah, reading this at like yeah. two in the morning last night, and now we're, you know, recording it. So it's yeah, like, yeah. you know, I've been thinking about it for, for a day, but it's not like, oh man, I've been sitting with this for, for weeks and months. It has been years. marrying. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, very spontaneous. And so, you know, a lot of this is still kind of forming, but those are the initial impressions. And I really, I do, I will go back to this and maybe there will be another episode in the future. I think it, I think it really, really, really gets at some very fascinating ideas uh, and for the most part, does it well as far as, you know, kind of what the ultimate point and, and how it all ties together. I, I, maybe it's open to interpretation. I, you know, I don't know. And, and I'll be curious to see where I fully land when, you know, the dust has settled. Yeah. But I would, yeah, I mean, look, we always talk about our, our time working at a comic book store, right? Is this not something yeah. that if someone came in and they were like, hey. I would recommend this to every customer who walked in the store. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If anything, just to have other people to bounce ideas off of. This was that kind of book. It was profound in that way. It was not a typical Superman, you know, rescuing a cat from a tree story. And this was deep, uh, which I really enjoyed of it. Um, and I think I'll keep it on my coffee table for a while. I really think it'll be there. It's something to flip through and reread passages for a little bit. Um, so, yeah, if you want to revisit this in a year, let me know. I'll also say that. I'm ex- I am looking forward to reading it again, either digitally or in the hardcover, which I assume will be a higher quality mm-hmm. paper stock than the single issues. Uh, we talk- I talked about this with Ken last week, and it was especially interesting getting his take as an artist where I've noticed recently in particular where the, the companies are not using the glossy paper that they used to, mm-hmm. that the art just doesn't pop the same. And one of the things that Ken brought up was that yeah. you know, the c- coloring is done digitally now like almost exclusively. So it just doesn't necessarily, you know, that's why when you look at it on an iPad screen, which is how I've, I've typically been reading recently, yeah. it looks the way the artist intended because they colored it digitally. Yeah. And now you're viewing it that way uh, when mm-hmm. it's translated to the print page. And especially if maybe the paper stock isn't, you know, isn't. Yeah, what, it's what it not. It's, it's somewhere in between like a modern comic book, like you were just describing and like an old eighties comic book, but it's fall short. It's not anything like either of the two. Um, yeah. but the colors so, I mean, are no less impressive in, in, you know, the, the print version. I, I don't know where I'm, you know, yeah. I mean, they're still there, but maybe not, like you said, on a computer screen is what they're intended to be viewed as. Yeah. Again, I, I just, not, not to harp on this, but I, I've just noticed in comparing things recently that it's just, uh, yeah, it just pops in a, in a, in a, in a different way. And the art, uh, is just, you know, kind of, kind of comes to life even more. So, so I'll be curious to, as, as good as it looked on the printed page, but whether it's the hardcover or the or reading it digitally, I think uh, it'll, it'll it'll stand out even more. So, listen, man, I thank you very much for for joining me yeah, uh, for to sure. talk Space Age. And listen, I you know I because again, I you know, we've talked about this. I know that you're not as much as I know you've you know a lifelong comic book fan. I know like you haven't yeah. been reading stuff regularly, so I, I appreciate you going out and getting these issues and reading them. And it was great to compare. And I was like, what well, used to do the at the f- store. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I love reading. Anytime you want to read uh, anything, please let me know. This is a rare instance where I had to go to a comic book store and get new issues because it's some, not something I had or I had read before. But just you know, to feed into what you just said, it made me go out and rebuy Crisis on Infinite Earth. I mean, it was that impactful, this story, that it made me want to continue to read. So that's something that's rare. Um, it doesn't happen anymore. Right on. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, audience. As always, I always appreciate you tuning in. It uh, really means a lot. Uh, if you want to join the conversation, uh, you can head on over to the Flat Squirrel Podcast Network Facebook group. Uh, you can connect with Digging for Kryptonite on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Shoot us an email, flatsquirrelproductions at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you, uh, especially about Space Age, because I know it's recent. It's on people's minds. I would love to know what, what people thought, especially in light of this conversation we just had. So thank you, everyone. We will be back in one week with our next all-new episode. As always, it's about what you do. It's about action. This show is part of the Flat Squirrel Podcast Network, home to Digging for Kryptonite, another exciting episode in the adventures of Superman, Summoning the Zords, and My Comic Shop History, available wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review today. Sign up at patreon.com slash anthonydesiato for additional content. Thank you all.